recording. Here we go. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for this is sort of a special edition of Chestnut Chat. Um, we had decided early on that we would only do every other month uh, this year for Chestnut Chat. Um, but it turns out that we're actually probably going to end up doing every month because there's plenty of material to cover. So uh, this month we're going to be talking a little bit about Dentata Base. Um, next month we'll be talking about the film. If you guys haven't had a chance to watch the trailer for the Chestnut documentary, it's called Clear Day Thunder. Uh, check it out on YouTube, just Google or put into YouTube Clear Day Thunder that then you'll get the trailer for the new documentary. It's premiering tomorrow night in Asheville. Um, so I'm actually here in West Virginia, um, halfway down, well not halfway, but more than halfway down to Asheville. So I'll be down at the North Carolina Arboretum tomorrow night for the movie my kids are in it so if you see the two little rugrats running around that was them two years ago and i'm pretty proud that they're in a movie and they're excited to be in a movie with dolly parton <laughs> so they, they've gotten some some cool stuff that they can share with their friends at school um in any event uh next month is uh the documentary and then um if we can get it together in june we're going to talk about pollination and collecting pollen so I think every summer uh, since we started Chestnut Chat, we've talked about pollination, different aspects of it. Oh, thanks for putting that link there in the chat, Kendra. Uh, it says to all panelists. It's, yeah, I actually, it's not letting me select you know, everyone else. else. Okay, I'll work on so that. So if you want to share it further, since you already know what it is, that would be great. No, there's there's a weird thing in the chat. They, they changed their... Um, Everyone can share with everyone. There we go. Try that again, Kendra. There we go. All right. Um, so in June, we're going to talk about how to collect pollen and store it. If we can get everybody together, I'm pretty sure we have a quorum of folks who can share that information. And then other chestnut chats we have planned um, in September, we'll, we'll celebrate the 40th anniversary of the American Chestnut Foundation and hopefully deregulation by that time, although not guaranteed. And then in November, uh, Michael French from Green Forest's work is going to be joining us to talk about um, uh, mine land reclamation work that he and uh, has been doing with with a lot of different great organizations. Oh, and I think we're we uh, we are trying in July to get uh, um, uh, the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Indians. I think we're going to get Tommy McCabe or Joey Owl to come and talk about the collaboration we've had with them. So. Those are the current known um, times and, and chestnut chats that we're having. Like I said, we were originally gonna do every other month, but I think we're gonna end up being here um, the third Friday of probably every month of this year as well. Um, okay, so uh, uh, Kendra just put a link to the trailer for the documentary that's coming out. Um, there's also, Kendra, I don't know if you can find it um, while I give an overview of Dentata Base. Um, there's a link to screen um, a, a showing of the film. So uh, we work with a group called Marketing Outpost. Um, they've been great in terms of helping us release the movie. So if you'd like to show the movie near near you and, and uh, get a group of folks together to watch it, um, there's a form that you can fill out. I know the Pennsylvania, New Jersey chapter is planning on showing it at their fall meeting, which is gonna be in Reading, PA on November the 1st, I think, or the 4th. Um, but uh, we're, we're lining up showings um, all around the Eastern US here this year. So today we're talking about Dentata Base. This has been a labor of love, Kendra, is that what you'd call it? For um, it's 20, yeah, for about 20 years. This is what I was hired to do um, originally. Um, and we're, we're, we're getting there with a, a specialized piece of software that we've been developing online. Um, so for those of you who don't, who don't know, I'm Sarah Fitzsimmons. I'm the Chief Conservation Officer for the American Chestnut Foundation. And this is... Can't find the mute button. This is Kendra Collins. I'm the Regional Science Coordinator Supervisor and um, New England Science Coordinator. I've been doing that for about 15 years. Great. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here and just give you guys a little bit of an overview about in database and why we're doing it and, and a little history of the, the project to give you a basis of and background of what we've been doing. Um, so I was hired as an intern 
in 1999 to start getting paper records digitized. And so I worked with the Pennsylvania chapter through the summer of 2000. I lived in Ann and Bob Leffel's basement. That's how I got my start with the organization. I drove around Pennsylvania collecting all of those paper records and putting them into Excel, basically. Um, over time, we then converted things into an access database. At MetaView, they were using an old program that's now no longer um, uh, used called HyperCard. Uh, it was on some old Macs. Um, people were, are, are still using Word documents. A lot of people had stuff on paper, and some, of, some people just have it up here in their heads. So um, when I started, I got hired full-time in 2003 at Penn State, and we talked with some uh, IT folks at Penn State about developing a database for us, and they were going to do it for free. And so we started down this road, and they realized it was a bigger project than they could handle. So we went out and we got some funding. Um, so Marshall Case, who was the executive director at the time, um, got about $20,000 in funding, and we developed a little program called eChestnut with a group called Dream Studios. Um, but actually, we realized it was bigger than that. <laughs> and so we went out, we got more funding. We got 30K and some friends up in Maine of Marshall's, the Resources First Foundation. Um, we were funded a little bit from um, uh, some folks in Pittsburgh to do TACFTrees.org and realized, too, that the project was way bigger than um, anybody had anticipated. And so um, all of those avenues. And I mentioned too, um, Top Tool, they're a freelance developer. They just put you in touch with, with folks. And that was also unsuccessful trying to work with um, just a, a, a freelance group and get people in and out ought to work on your program. The, the issue with um, going that direction was we had not yet sat down. And if you who have done software development will be like, yeah, you guys should have done this in the first place. We, we didn't know but what we had to do was develop what we wanted the thing to look like. What would it do? What, what are the different aspects? Um, we had to create an entity relationship diagram. How, how are the data related to one another in all different aspects? Um, create pages. If I, if like, do I want a map here? And if I click on it, what's that gonna do? And um, how am I gonna break things down into their most, um, specific units. So it's not just people planting trees, um, which is what you guys want to do, right? You just want to be able to click on a page and plant a tree, quote unquote. But there's so much more that goes into it as we found out. So um, we were very lucky to have um, one of the main reasons I love working for the American Chestnut Foundation. It's just you all, the kind of people that I get to meet um, Bill Adamson was a founding president of the Connecticut chapter, and he his background is um, project management, software development for a big credit card company in, in New York. Uh, we also have Jack Ostroff, also in our Connecticut chapter, who did um, database design and uh, testing for a pharmaceutical company for many years. And so with their collective help and then we also had some great scientific input from John Scrivani in Virginia. He's done this with the Virginia Department of Forestry, trying to get databases together. Yvonne Federowitz in um, Rhode Island helped us a ton with great information. Marty Cipollini at Berry College in Georgia helped us get a design together. And after about a year and a half, and what was that weekly meetings, I think, Kendra, um, to get a design together, we, we got a package and we put out a request for proposal. Um, and uh, those proposals came back anywhere between, I think some people said they could do it for about 50 grand and the high end was about 500,000. And that was to develop what we had designed and that was in 2009. So um, we picked a sort of middle of the road developer to start us down the path. We didn't have $500,000 at the time. I think we had, I think we kicked off with 90. I think we kicked off with $90,000 that we had from SFI, the Sustainable Forestry Initiative, and we started development. Um, since then, um, I, I think it's really important to know this. This is a lot of words, and, and I've got it in a different format if you want to, but it's also being recorded so you can study it if you really want to. This is what we decided we needed to have in a software system that took all of those different elements and put them in into one place. So not 
everybody's computer having their own stuff or and all in different formats. How do we get all this data together so that we can analyze them in one place? So data management was the most important piece. We wanted it to be highly usable. We'll get that to that here in a minute. Um, we wanted it to be web-based because we're so spread out and because we have so many different people working on it, we wanted everybody to access it at the same time. We wanted some mechanism of data import and export. We wanted some mechanism of reporting. Um, the software ar architecture was an important decision. What, what kind of language is, is this going to be created in? We wanted tiered access. So we don't want everybody seeing everything all the time because there's a lot of sensitive geographic and personal information housed in this database. Um, we want to have operational support. We want to put it in a system that uh, we can count on other people knowing how to use for, for as long as possible. Um, and then that we had a design that was hosted in an easy to use fashion. So currently Dentatabase is hosted on Heroku. It is created in open source. It's written in Ruby on Rails. Um, and that's what we decided back in 09, 2010 because of the developer that we had chosen. And, and we have since been, we've stayed in that architecture and in that system. Um, what's gonna be really, what we really wanted to do in Dentatabase was create a, a place where people could plant anywhere from a small amount of trees to large amount of trees. And our biggest issue was the data management we sacrificed, so I'm going to go back to this, we sacrificed a lot of usability, our second most important aspect for management. So I will say at this point, um, Dentatabase is very functional, but it's not highly usable. And that's what we're trying to correct at this point, especially as we have more and more users coming into the system. We do have mapping. We do have real-time data entry and retrieval. We are able to enter observations. And it's not just about saying, oh, here's a tree's DBH at any given time. It's about being able to say, here's a DBH at a bunch of different time points so you can monitor growth and it's on this singular tree. Um, we can um, track people and what they do in, and, in the system and in real life, which we thought was really important because volunteers play such a huge role in our work. And like I said, it's, it's open source. So we can integrate into other systems or port it over should we ever need to do that. Getting back to that issue of usability versus functionality, I just wanted to make a really quick comparison with something with another program that you guys might be really familiar with. So TreeSnap is a program that we've promoted as a way to easily find trees and get them out. I'm sure many of you on here have already used um, TreeSnap. Um, so that program costs about $3 million to develop. Um, they currently have 7,500 users. There's about 85, this, is, this data is about a year old. So, so it's, I think it's higher than that now. Um, there's about 8,500 trees in there of which 4,000 or so are American chestnuts. So about half of their, the trees reported are American chestnuts. And when you download the data as a, as a high level science scientific user, you get a flat file that has all observations, not just of chestnut, but um, of everything else. So um, from a functionality data management standpoint, they really focused on usability. And it's highly usable, and lots of people are using it, but it's not a very robust system. You can't make multiple observations. So if I have a tree that I find out there on TreeSnap, you know, I put that point in, I say what DBH it is. If I want to go back and make an observation on that tree and say, here's that same tree, it's now an inch larger, you can't do that you have to make a whole new observation about that tree in order to get that information and they're not linked. So compare that to what we've done at Intatabase. I'm gonna admit right now, <laughs> it is not highly usable. We're getting better, um, but we're gonna cover some of those usability features here, but that's because we focused on data collection, making it a place to be able to house all this data, um, so that we had it standardized and in one place. So, you know, we've spent, again, we've, it's a little bit higher than that. I think we're at about eight fifty, eight hundred fifty thousand dollars $850,000 since 2009 that we've spent on this system. We get, we have about 150 active users. So a far, far less than TreeSnap. Again, a real testament to usability. Um, but look at how much data we have in here. We've got 13,000 crosses. We've got 370,000 trees, uh, almost 4,000 of which are wild trees. And we have 629,000 observations logged across all those trees. So, you know, just make that comparison between usability and, and robust data collection. 
Um, why do we need this? I'm going to talk about it a little bit more in depth when I talk about crosses, but really we need to be able to track the progress of our work, not only tracking the progress, but be able to compare um, performance across location. So here's a map that, that I use, uh, that, I, that I create. I create this outside the system in, in ArcView, but I, I have all the data. I download that from Dentatabase. I create this map of what kinds of plantings we've done over the past year. Um, for, for me to get this snapshot, we have to have those data and we have to have a singular pl place and collection where we can house all that information. So it's really important from a, uh, a data analysis standpoint, from a tracking progress standpoint, um, that we have a singular standardized location where we can have all that information. We intend on making Dentatabase better. We've recently acquired some additional funding. Um, I think we've got about $200,000 in the wings to get us to do two more phases of development um, to track a lot of these things and to increase usability. Right now, our main focus in Dentatabase is to make it more usable, get more people in the system, make it something that's fun to use and not something that you wanna beat your head up against a wall trying. We're not there yet, but, but we will be, I promise. Um, so we need to be able to track distribution of transgenic materials. That's something that we're gonna get into um, extensively today, uh, not just the distribution, but their planting and reporting on their performance, um, restoration outplantings. We wanna use it as a tool for outreach and engagement. We want it to be able to be a tool where people can say, hey, where's the nearest publicly accessible, not your private plantings, but where's the nearest publicly accessible planting that I can go see or wild tree that I can go see and engage with American chestnuts, especially uh, transgenic chestnuts. You know, this will be one of the first opportunities that people can have to interact with transgenic material and see it's not really that scary and it's not getting out of hand. Um, what are the next things that we're gonna to have to be able to support? We have to be able to look far in the future and say, what other technologies is this system or might we want to track in this system? So we're looking at other um, types of technology, gene editing, things like that, that we wanna make sure we're poised to capture in database as those things happen. Um, and we wanna be able to pivot to other different scientific directions and create new types of reporting and analytics over time. So as a group, um, Kendra and I have been meeting on a weekly basis since 2009 to talk about Dentatabase and its creation with our various developers. Jack Ostroff is still with us. Most of the rest of the team have um, moved on to other directions. I wanna give a shout out also to one of the newest members on our team, Asuntha um, in New Jersey. She's been a, a gigantic help um, with her expertise in creating these kinds of systems. If you yourself are a software developer or work in this, we will gladly invite you to our Tuesday noon meetings um, to join in and help us not only create and design new systems, but also test them and figure out how to make this better. Um, because it, this is gonna be a project that's gonna be ongoing for, for quite some time. Um, that's the end of my preamble about uh, the history of Chess, of Dentatabase. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Kendra, unless Kendra, there are any questions that I should answer in the chat. You can look while I'm uh, screen sharing. Okay. Uh, if there's anything too, too pressing. Not yet. Okay. All right. Are you guys seeing my screen? Yes, you're starting to get your voices there. getting a little okay. There you go. Awesome. DSL. Um, so Sarah, thanks for that um, overview of you know sort of database history. Uh, I'm gonna focus a little bit more. Looks like my video is freezing. I'm gonna stop video while I'm sharing here. Um, so I was just going to focus a little bit more on the use of the system and, and who's interacting with this, and we'll we'll wrap up with kind of what our focus is for the rest of the training here. If this wants to move forward. Okay. Oop, there we go. All right. So as you could imagine, after the, the long preamble that Sarah just shared, staff, our science staff are, are kind of the primary 
users. We're not the primary audience. Um, the primary audience is much wider than that. At this point, because the system is more functional than fun, um, a lot of the use of the system has fallen on TACF staff, and particularly our science staff, to work on filling the database with all of the program data we've generated over the past 40 years. Um, you know, Sarah didn't mention, or I don't think she did, but um, you know, our Meadowview farm used to have all their data on a system called HyperCard. And one of the additional drivers to getting this system developed was that HyperCard was only supported on really old Mac laptops and just even getting the hardware to support that system became really challenging. So we needed a place to put everything. Um, so, you know, Jared utilizes this system to get program-wide data for doing big analyses of where things stand for various aspects of our breeding and scientific programs. The regional science coordinators work very um, closely with the database. Uh, one of our charges is to get all of our regional data in. And so many of you from our chapters, we've worked with you to get your orchards in, to understand your records so that we can make sure that they're accurately um, stored in the Dent in Dentatabase. Meadowview uses Dentatabase to track all the work they're doing. Um, and we certainly have some other um, folks on staff who interact with the system in smaller ways. You know, one of the one of the ways I'm hoping our new outreach coordinators are going to be able to use the system is to look at who's been reporting wild trees. We track all the wild tree reports that come in through Dentatabase. And so there's this wealth of interested people who are tracked in Dentatabase as folks who have taken the time to send in wild trees. And so there may be some engagement we could do there beyond just the scientific work of tracking those trees. Uh, Sarah had some great figures already. Um, I looked at planted trees the other day and there's over 335,000 just planted trees that doesn't include wild trees that doesn't include trees that have been planted and removed because they've died over the years um, so that's kind of a current snapshot there's a lot in the system for our science staff to to play with in addition our chapters utilize the system some more than others but we've really worked hard to get all of our chapter data in Dentatabase it's an ongoing process. We're always finding more things that we're missing or records that are harder to decipher or figure out the best way to kind of fit them into Dentatabase, uh, but we're getting there. Um, and we certainly have a lot in the system. There's a, little, a lot more in the system than is remaining outside the system, which is a great place to be. Um, so as far as the chapters, our chapter leaders, um, and especially, you know, chapter board members that want to just kind of know where things are, know the state of, of their chapter, can have access to the system to look more specifically at what's in their chapter. Chapter science folks um, can, you know, work closely with the RSCs, the regional science coordinators, um, to ensure that the records are up to date for their chapter, to get data sheets to bring out in the field when they're doing uh, work in the various orchards. Orchard managers can have access, you know, Sarah talked about tiered access, you know, so the RSCs, like we have access to everything, um, especially if, you know, Sarah and I are both administrators on the system, we can see everything. Um, if you're a science person for your chapter, we can make sure that you can see everything for your chapter and edit everything in your chapter, but not necessarily mess around with someone else's. Um, and, you know, and same for chapter leaders, orchard managers, we can give you granular, you know, we can get down to the orchard level so that we can give you access just to your specific orchard if that's where you need to be editing, um, but not necessarily give you access to be able to see what's in your neighbor's orchard. Uh, there is, um, a lot of personally identifiable information in the database when it comes to location of orchards and wild trees. And so we are fairly, you know, we, we, ha we have to walk the line of being open and sharing as much as possible so that people can see what, what's going on in the program with, you know, balancing that with protecting the locations of things that are on private property um, and, and ensuring that if someone reports a wild tree to us, they're not worried that that location is being broadcast to all 150 database users or however many more we get um, as we open up the system further. So be assured if you, know, if you have an orchard on private property, if you have a wild tree reported, the locations for those are generally protected 
and visible to those who quote need to know. So system administrators can see everything. Regional science coordinators can see everything. We're generally trusted not to show up unannounced. Um, and then within the chapters, we, we kind of, um, we work on that on a case by case basis to see, you know, who really needs that information to be able to do their volunteerism. But that brings us to personal use by members, you know, the, the, the functionalities for science coordinators and, you know, folks on our science staff for our chapters are a little bit more clunky. It's more about data management. It's not necessarily as, as much about usability. And so it's a smaller number of people. But our focus today and where we really want to get more of our members using the database is for small backyard plantings. So for personal use, um, we have some new functionality that we'll go over in a little bit that um, is a lot easier to use and is kind of neat to be able to track small plantings in your backyard. So that's really where we're going to focus today. The backyard plantings, or we call it our citizen scientist role in the database, um, is really for small numbers of trees. Um, you could, you know, I think 30 is probably about the limit where I would recommend certainly not more than 50, 100 would be really pushing it um, because the functionality is to point and click on a map to show where you wanna plant your trees. Um, so anything that's on a grid or resembling a grid, there's you know kind of the standard traditional way we've been entering plantings that can be used, um, but this new functionality is great for small numbers of trees or trees that aren't planted in a traditional orchard layout. Um, it's great for private property and, per, you know, personal plantings um, in your backyard, in your front yard, in your side yard. Uh, and we can also use it for small outreach plantings. And there is a way to make those viewable, whereas anything you're doing in your backyard is really only viewable to you as a, a user in the system and not something that is discoverable by others. Um, so that leads me to when can I get an account? <laughs> um, We've been really pushing on, you know, we want to make this open for everyone and come on, get an account, let's get you in there. We still really like to do that, but we're not quite ready. We didn't realize how many people would be asking for accounts on a regular basis. And there's some kind of housekeeping work that we need to do to be a little bit more ready to get folks in there. Because right now it's taking a lot of staff time for us to get one person on at a time to get them oriented, to get them access to the things they need um, to be able to actually use the system. So we're not quite ready, but there are some things you can work on now so that when we are ready to open that up more widely, um, you'll have everything you need and it'll be nice and easy to log in, plant, plant your trees through the system and, and start tracking them. Um, so, you know, the big thing is what do you have? And if you can start working on tracking down where your trees came from, that would be really helpful. Um, you know, was there a tag? Was there any information? Was there an email? Was there something that came along with your trees that had some sort of source? Um, or do you have some notes on at least when it came in? And I think we're going to go over that in a little bit more detail. I think, yeah, that's where I was going to end for now, so Sarah can talk a little more about crops. I will, and I, I like this question that Eva put in the chat. Do you foresee a means to include a soil layer or site suitability mapping data, perhaps not through Dentatabase, but some other platform that is easy to access? We just got funded, thank you Fidelity, um, uh, for getting us uh, some, some funding for uh, something called a landowner site suitability um, program. So we will be able to go on, or it's, uh, landowners will be able to go on and click around, create a polygon and um, see whether or not a site is suitable. So we're working with, if you, if you guys remember Jen Santoro and Alec Henderson from a previous Chestnut Chat on site suitability and habitat site selection. Um, we are working with them to improve that model. Uh, they had just done Pennsylvania, so they're gonna expand that out range wide. And then we'll work on creating a front end to um, so that people can go and play around. It will not be um, integrated in the beginning with database. Perhaps at some point we will, um, but for now that's gonna be a totally separate system. Um, let me see if there are any other questions in here. 
uh, terms of tracking wild trees for now. Yeah, continue using TreeSnap for wild trees. We're still working on making those systems talk to one another, um, but I think TreeSnap is better set, suited for collecting uh, the kind of information that people want to on, on wild trees. Um, I planted wild type seedlings in my yard and labeled trees and tubes. Can someone tell me what Clements means? Uh, and if that's the type of tree that belongs in Dentata Base. Yeah, so Clements Nursery uh, is a location in, it was a, the state nursery of West Virginia. And unfortunately it, it recently closed down, but there were some wild Americans planted at that location that were then collected and put into the wild type um, uh, seedling program. So yes, definitely keep, keep that tag. You might see things that say Clements, you might see things that say, um, Han, H-A-U-N, you might see things that just say Ohio, whatever you can have um, for what you're distributed is gonna be really important. And so that's why I'm talking about crosses. I'm talking about where your trees come from. And this gets into a really fundamental issue that we've had to deal with in Dentata Base as to which came first, the chestnut or the tree. And it's a, it's a chicken the egg thing, like wh which comes first and which do you put into Dentata Base first. Um, currently, we can put in a cross, which is what creates a, a nut, right? We can put a cross in the system without um, necessarily having the trees that made that cross. At some point, we're gonna have to shut that off. Um, right now, um, you cannot plant a tree without having a cross that it comes from. So in Dentata Base, we make distinctions between a planted tree and a wild tree, not because they specifically have to have been planted or wild. We make that distinction as a planted tree must have come from a cross. So I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna pop into um, the cross system um, here. There we go. You see that Kendra, does that look all right? Yep, you're good. All right. So in Dentata Base, I mean, I think Kendra will go into some of the other systems and, and I'm currently into my admin account. So when um, through that tiered access control system, different access levels of accounts can see different stuff. A quote unquote public account, which has very little access, are going to see fewer menu items up here. And then an, an admin account is going to see way more. Uh, there's me, there's my name. Um, and then here's crosses. Here in trees, if I click that menu, you'll see I've got planted trees here and wild trees here and removed trees here. So when Kendra presented that number of 335,000, that's just planted trees. There's a whole bunch more removed trees, trees that were planted and then have been subsequently culled or cut down or died for whatever reason, removed and then replanted in that given uh, location. Um, and then wild trees are totally different. So the distinction of a planted tree versus a wild tree in this system is that wild trees, we don't know the origin of them. Obviously they had to have come from a cross, right? Because you can't have a tree without have having a nut and you can't have a nut without trees having created that nut, but where do you start? Um, so wild trees are sort of the start of you know being able to make crosses. Um, so in crosses, uh, we are tracking both open poly um, the, the, the origin of being an open cross where it's just open pollen. So a wild tree receives pollen from another tree, be it wild or, or open or, or planted, we don't know. Um, that then becomes an open pollinated cross versus control pollinated crosses where we know both the mom and dad. So here these crosses, a bunch from New York, um, the old naming, naming system in the New York chapter was to name them um, by a numerical system and you see by open. And that just means that tree 05001 uh, was, was pollinated through open pollination. We collected the seed in 1994. Um, the seed type is an American chestnut, Castadia dentata. There were 50 nuts collected. That's from the old ring line. So um, we've got 320 pages <laughs> of crosses, and I actually don't have the number of crosses off the top of my head um, as to how many we have, but um, that's going to be really important and why we're asking you all to know what your tag says. 
or what you planted. And I've talked with some of you about the derivation of some of your trees. Some of you know, I got it from some guy in Indiana or I got it from some woman up in Maine. The more information you have about that background, um, including not just some guy in Indiana or some lady in Maine, like what is their name? Where did they get the material that they have? Um, that's gonna be really important. Um, and the main reason that that's important is because of um, this, this map right here. Um, when we're talking about tracking the diversification of American chestnut and restoration populations, and then subsequently planting them, one of the biggest issues that we wanna be able to monitor is where is the background of a given tree. So if a tree is in Indiana, did that tree actually come from Indiana? So just as an example, I know a lot of plantings in Indiana, they actually come from material from West Virginia and Virginia. Um, so when we get that material, it's not coming from West, it's not coming from Indiana, which we would actually like to have be from Indiana because that represents a different state of diversity versus West Virginia or Virginia. Um, while there are probably niche and specific areas of regionalization and adaptability, based on current analysis from our colleagues at Virginia Tech, this is a great project that um, Jared Westbrook has been doing with um, Jason Holliday and, and uh, a couple other folks at, at Tech. Um, there are a minimum of three specific geographic regions of diversity within the American chestnut. We've got a, a huge um, uh, realm of Northern type diversity that includes New England and part of the Mid-Atlantic. We've got a central portion of diversity that includes a lot of Kentucky and the Shenandoah, South Jersey, areas like that, the mountains of, of um, North Carolina and Tennessee. And then we have the Southern state of diversity. And for us to be able to track really well the kind of diversification we've been doing, we, we originally wanted to breed on a thousand wild type American chestnuts. We do want to do that eventually with D58, specifically just D58, where we have our eye on about 200 uh, wild type backgrounds. Um, but we don't want all 200 to just come from a single location, like in my backyard. You know, I could go behind my house in State College, PA, and get you 200 wild type American chestnuts. Um, but that's not going to be enough diversity to represent the whole of this range. So when we ask you, where does your tree come from? And for us to be able to properly track it and put it into this algorithm so that we know we are really capturing the suite of diversity of the wild um, population and then redistributing it back into the wild, we want to be able to do that as well as possible. So you also have issues of not only knowing the background of the tree to track diversification, but knowing the background of the tree to knowing then where to plant it. So for you all, I'm sure many of you are on here because you wanna make your own crosses. You know, you guys have been planting wild type Americans to be able to put pollen on, take those nuts and then plant on your own property. And that's perfectly fine. Um, you know, for our purposes, we wanna be able to know that if you, if you then send some of those nuts to us, we are able to say, where is this coming from? And can we incorporate that into our diversification program? So at this moment, we are prioritizing locations of known provenance, of, of locations that we know where stuff came from, so we can match it up to this map so that we can track that programming. Um, for those of you who have no information, you don't know where it came from, you don't know what year it came from, we'll eventually get you in here. Um, but that's where getting back to what Kendra said in terms of what can you do to help us get you into the system? We need to know the distribution of the material that it came from. Um, the other thing is from uh, that we'll be tracking from for the EPA, um, we've been told that they are going to need to track where stuff goes. Um, to whom material has been distributed. So um, we, we do have a distribution module in here. So if I click on um, crosses, I have um, different things that I can distribute to different people. So um, because the EPA is treating D58 as a registered pesticide or fungicide, um, you need to be able, <clears throat> we need to be able to, to uh, provide a report of where material has been distributed. And this is gonna be a great way to do that. So both pollen and seeds, um, 
this is how we track those distributions. So we can say, if I create a new seed bot distribution, again, going back to that cross, I, I take some seed that were created from um, the, the crossing of one chestnut tree with another. The, I may or may not know the male parent, but I know the female parent, parent from which it was collected. I click in the cross name here. Again, I get to get that list of crosses. I can type in, um, I know a couple of these, this is one of my favorites. Um, let's do this for you. So here we've got, you know, hickories, here's ORT times CL287, one of the first crosses that I ever worked with. Um, I can type in when it was distributed, who it came from, um, who to whom it's going, uh, how many seeds I gave, let's say I gave 5,000 seeds, 50,000 seeds. Um, did I send seeds, seedlings, or embryos? Um, how it was distributed hand off uh, at parking lot, because that's sometimes how we do that. And then what was the purpose of the planting and then some comments. In order to for you all to do the, the citizen science planting that Kendra is gonna talk about, we need to create this distribution for you. So. There's some elements we need to know. We need to know what the, what the stuff is that you planted, but we need to be able to create this distribution, who it came from and who it went to. So you might've gotten material. So that Clements example was, would probably be something like distributed from TACF, you, whoever you are, um, and then how many you got. We create this distribution, we give it to you, once you have an account in Dentatabase, you then have access to plant that material. And that way we have a full accounting, um, not only that you planted a tree, which we do want to know, but we want to know where that tree and where those seeds came from, who they came from, by what nature, what is the provenance and what is the background. So it's going to be important for a couple of different reasons. Just to recap, we want to be able to track the background and diversification that we're doing on these materials. We want to be able to track to whom they're going and how, how far and how spreading this material is going out. Um, and we want to be able to track um, the, uh, the specific lines um, that they're going out so that you can then track them in database. I will say, you know, we from a regulatory standpoint, we don't, as we understand it, we don't have to say exactly where the things went, but we do have to say to whom they were distributed and how many. Kendra, you just came on. Oh, I just wanted to see if um, my video would cooperate and okay. not be wonky. So, well, no, I, I think that that's a good, a good place for me to stop. I think I covered pretty much everything I wanted to there. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and um, see if there's any questions in here. Did you see yeah, anything? There's a few that have come in. Um, uh, there was one question about, um, while I'm getting my screen sharing going, um, TACF distributions. And I'm gonna talk about the bulk distributions we know about in a minute here. So I will get to that one. Well, while you do that, I'll, I'll, I'll answer. So will it be easy to track trees purchased through TACF, for example, the recent sale on March 21st? So yeah. yes, so we're working on doing, are, is that what you're gonna talk about, Kendra? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> um, for wild trees, are you tracking trees that uh, came from American chestnut roots going back a long time? Yes, we are. Uh, most, of, most of those are, are what the wild trees we're, we're talking about um, cover. Um, Bill, I'm finding with the help of friends, many trees in central to northern Michigan and don't know their provenance, but I'm sure they're descendants from somewhere else. Is there someone or entity that can examine the germplasm and help pinpoint their point of origin? Not yet. I mean, we do have some really good genotyping tools that are getting to that point. Kendra, do you want to share that recent one that you and Anna were going back and forth about? That was a neat thing. Those European trees? Oh, just... Oh, sorry. I thought you were like asking me to pull up something. Oh, um, no. Yeah, no, Anna. So one of our board members was in Belgium. Is that I think Belgium. Was? Yeah. 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 And she went to a, um, an arboretum that had some American chestnuts in it. And I guess must have grabbed some leaf samples or something. <laughs> Not really sure. We'll pretend that that was totally kosher. Just bring leaf samples back to the U.S. Um, and she shared them with Virginia Tech and they were able to genotype them and pinpoint with some accuracy. It's, they're pretty big circles, but that both of them 
had come from southern Vermont, most likely. Um, so that's kind of neat. Um, you know, presumably they, I would imagine, probably came from the same source if it's just two trees. But, um, but yeah, so that, I mean, so that gave us a general idea of where they came from. You know, for now, if you know trees are planted, let us know that because we can track that as part of wild trees. Um, I always make a note of wild trees, wild trees that were planted so that when we are looking to represent the native population in whatever capacity, whether that's a research study or just diversification of D58 and likely coming from those remnant rootstocks versus trees that someone bought from whoever and have planted. You know, like I know where I am in northern Vermont, there are a lot of trees that came from Cadillac, Michigan through a soil conservation service distribution in the 90s. There's a lot of folks who have fairly healthy flowering trees. I think they're all getting to the age where they're probably going to start seeing blight, but they're in primarily Northern Vermont where there's not a lot of chestnut and there hasn't been a lot of blight yet. Um, and so those are great trees to know about, but those aren't trees that I would necessarily wanna use for our program for diversification because they don't represent native Vermont germplasm. Um, all right, so I'm gonna transition a little bit. So we're actually gonna look at the database in a minute here and show you guys how you can plant your trees once you know what you have. So we're gonna talk about planting backyard trees. Um, and so just to kind of define what we're talking about here, so a backyard planting, you, so there's two ways that we can get trees into the system. The, the traditional way that our science staff um, has been working with and, and teaching some of our chapter folks to use is to create a grid and plant the trees into the grid spaces. And it's, it's great for orchard tracking. It's not the easiest to set up once it's there, it's it's a good system. I think it works well enough for me, but it's not the most intuitive and it's certainly not easy if you just have a couple of trees planted. So we actually worked with a UI, um, you know, user interface designer to help us make this better for small numbers of trees. You know, everyone that, that Sarah mentioned earlier on the team are scientists and database people and data management people. We're not necessarily designers to make things easy for folks. We, we just know what, what functionality we need. So Chelsea has really helped on our team to create much prettier things than we have had in the past. And so this is a functionality that she helped us design for planting small numbers of trees that are not really on a grid. So we're typically, when we're talking about backyard plantings, most of these are gonna be trees that members um, got from somewhere. Maybe it's a TACF distribution program, maybe it's their chapter, maybe it's the local nursery, ACCF, my buddy Jim that likes chestnut trees, um, wherever, and planted those in your backyard or your front yard, or your side yard, or at your vacation home, you know, wherever it is, but these are on private property and they're small numbers of trees. We can also use this functionality for small outreach plantings. And we haven't, it's not really optimized for that use yet, but we are keeping kind of an eye on the functionality to make sure that we are also able to accommodate those small plantings because the point and clip mapping to be able to get those kinds of trees in is really nice for tracking outreach and demonstration plantings. Um, it's just, we wanna be able to find those in the system and we don't necessarily want everyone's backyard planting to show up in the list of chapter plantings. Um, I don't think anyone wants that. You don't want your personal trees in that list and the folks working with chapter data don't wanna to have to sift through you know, 50 backyard plantings to find the orchard, orchard sites they're looking uh, for. So again, these accommodate plantings that are not on a grid. If you'd have a grid, even if it's a small grid, I would recommend working with our orchard planting module instead. But if you have small number of trees that are kind of dispersed and you can zoom into a map and point and click um, to find the right spots, this is, this is where you want to be. As Sarah mentioned, in order to access something to plant, material must be distributed to you through the system. We need to know what you've got, and then we need to go in and distribute it to you as a user so that you have something in your list of crosses. Um, I'm getting a notice that my video, my system is being 
unstable. So I'm going to turn my video off again. Um, so yeah, so again, this is why we really need to know what you have and the, the ones that are easy that we can pull from some known lists of distributions um, or known distribution programs. Those are the ones that we're going to be able to get in first. Um, but the, if you don't know what you have and we don't know what you have, you won't have anything to plant through this module. It's kind of a required piece. So I'm going to see if I can pull up my browser here and actually show you how, how this works. So if once you have an, uh, an account in our system, we would assign you, initially you won't have any permissions. You can just poke around. You can look at a lot of stuff, uh, but you won't be able to actually do anything. But we can give you a role called citizen scientist, and that opens up this little dashboard for you. Now, for folks who have used the system um, for more than just this functionality, you might have other things in your dashboard, but most of you, if you're just getting on for the first time, your dashboard is only going to have things that you created in it. And I just created this citizen scientist role for my testing account. I don't have anything else in it. Um, I figured that would be a little bit more familiar for you guys um, trying to get on here and do this yourself in the future. So you have this little box here that so adds sit sci planting, citizen scientist planting. Um, we'd love feedback on whether or not sit sci planting is intuitive to you guys. That's lingo that we've been using, but maybe it's not as intuitive. If there's a, something else creative that, or maybe more informative that we could call this, please let us know. We're not opposed to changing things and making it more clear. Um, so I don't have any locations here yet. If I did, um, there'd be a list here of locations that I could plant into, but I'm just going to create a new location and get started. So the, the landing page here um, lands, the map lands you on the main office, but you can add, enter whatever address you want. So the first hey, thing is, hey, yes. Kendra, are you, are you trying to show us the system or are you still showing us? Yeah. You were just, no, seeing, we're just yeah. seeing PowerPoint. Oh, shoot. All right. Let me change that. You know what? I think, uh, thank you for letting me know. I was well, that, sharing... that was all Evan. Thank you, Evan. There we go. Let's just share the whole screen there. Is that better? So let me go back. All right, cool. I just got a little screen share. Okay, yeah, sweet. There you go. So yep. this is the login screen. Um, and this is the sit side planting box. Again, so if this, this language is not super intuitive and you have a better idea, let us know. If you don't have a better idea and you don't think it's in, intuitive, maybe keep it to yourself. We love suggestions and not complaints. <laughs> um, but um, anyway, so you'll have this little box. Um, if you have more than one location, all your, plant option, all your potential planting locations would show up here. I don't have anything, so I just have a new one. And then you just click this green button to get started. So the first thing you need to tell this, um, this module, um, sort of this wizard that'll walk you through planting your trees is where are they located? The map um, defaults to the main office, but we can plant stuff anywhere. I'm gonna go with my office, because why not? So this is my office in Burlington and my building. And so this is a good location for me to go with planting. So I'm just gonna say that this is where I want to plant and hit next. Now, there's a couple things that you can um, say about this planting location and, and about this planting. So this is where we start entering a few of those details. You can give your planting location a name. And so then when you go back to your dashboard, you'll have a list of names of locations where you have planted. Most of you are probably only gonna have one or maybe two. Um, but if you're helping enter outreach plantings or demonstration plantings, you might have a decent list of those uh, that you wanna that you wanna enter. So I'm gonna call this New England office. And I'm gonna say that this is a public location because I don't care if people can find this in the system or come and visit. My office is a university and US Forest Building, Forest Service building. It is not a secret where it is. Um, but for the most part, you probably want to say that this is a private location uh, so that it's only visible to you and system administrators like Sarah and I. 
So do that. And then you want to know the date that you planted because you're going to need to enter that. So now if you planted this 15, you know, 10 years ago and you know it was in the spring, maybe you just pick May 15th of 2010 or whatever. Um, an approximate date, if you don't have the exact date, is fine. You know, this is mostly for your records, but the closest you can get, the better. I'm going to say I planted this on Monday. And then the last thing you need to tell this wizard is how many trees you planted. We don't need this to take all day, so I'm going to plant three trees and move on. So now I get to name my first tree. We'll just call this tree one. And I want to zoom in on this map a little bit more so that I can really see where I'm planting this. And I want to plant this right in the front yard. So the first thing I need, though, I need to find my tree. So I have two crosses that have been distributed to me as, um, as this particular user. So I'm going to plant this one. I'm going to say it's planted as a seed. You could play it, plant it as a seed or a seedling. You also have a few other options. Um, most of these are for grafting or for tissue culture, but they're available if you happen to have something that fits that model. And now I'm gonna say tree one is right here. And I can put that really wherever and you can zoom in as much as you want on that map to do that. So I'm gonna hit save. I'm going to call this one Frank. I'm going to say it's this other cross that I planted it as a seedling. And I want to make sure it is right next to this one. I want to put it right there. Hit save. And we've got one more tree. Select the type. Say this one is also a seed. And I'm going to say that maybe I planted this one, I don't know, back behind the greenhouse. Why not? And hit save. And it, I only said I was going to plant three trees. I think it'll let you keep adding them if you want to. But if I go back up here, I can see these are the three trees that I have planted. And there's some info about them. So if I wanted to go in and edit that, I could. Um, Maybe I decided that, you know what, never mind. I don't actually want to plant Thelma. Let's just skip Thelma for today. So you have some, some options here. Kendra, and, um, yes. we had a question about naming conventions. Do, are, are there any conventions or recommendations we have for people in the Sitsai planting for naming Not them? Really. I mean, really you know, for the chapters and in wild trees, we want the names to be unique across the system and to be somewhat meaningful. I think whatever is going to be meaningful for you so that you are going to remember which tree is which is what I would go with. Um, you know, if you only have a few trees, naming them something cute is totally fine. If you have, you know, 10, 15, 20, you may want to include a number or a letter or something in there to help keep track of those. Um, or maybe if you have a couple groupings, incorporate that into your naming. Certainly, if you have questions and are hemming and hawing about the best way to do that, feel free to reach out. But there, I don't think we have any real um, strong conventions or recommendations for backyard plantings. All right, so I'm going to hit next. And so this wants to know if I want to continue with planting two trees because I told the system I was going to plant three. So it it does try to make you do what you say you want to do, but I'm just going to say yes. I want to continue with just planting those. Um, and so this is just a little review screen to look at what I planted. I'm happy with this, so I'm going to hit finish. And so now when I get to my dashboard, I have a planting here. And when I look at a location, no, I should have a location. I'm not sure why I don't have a location. But um, I could go back to this planting. I could add more trees to it. Um, or I could create a new location for planting small numbers of trees. So hopefully that kind of made sense. Um, so 
you know, in order for you guys to get the, your plantings in and be able to do what I just did, we need to distribute seeds to you, crosses to you, which Sarah went over. And we're really working right now on finalizing the development of a bulk distribution um, tool so that we can get bulk distributions into the database. And so that would be things like TACFs, wild type um, seedling sales, TACFs, seed level um, membership sale, or not sales, but membership distributions. Um, and then if the chapters have distribution programs and records of those, we can start helping them get those records together so that those can be entered as well. The more of those things we have kind of backloaded into the system, the easier and more seamless it will be for us to give you an account and have your stuff just there for you. Um, I saw a lot of comments in the chat about really specific um, cases of trees with, uh, you know, kind of wonky backgrounds <laughs> and um, lost records and things. And we can absolutely work with you to come up with as much of, uh, you know, getting as much information in the system as possible to get those plantings in. But the first priority is going to be to handle the ones that are easy and that are part of these these bigger bulk distributions. So if you've got funny situations, we can definitely work with you. But um, the what we would ask for you is to get as much of your data together as you can on what those crosses are. So what was the cross or any descriptor? whatever details you have that will help us pinpoint what tree they came from or maybe where, you know, generally where they came from. Um, in some cases, you know, you may know the name of someone and maybe we know that they're part of a chapter and we can, you know, sort through those little little rat's nests um, and, and get, get where we need to be. The year the material is distributed to you, the year you received the material is really helpful because that can help us figure out what year the cross was created. Um, if it was a seed or a seedling, if it was a seedling, how old was that seedling? Um, TACF's programs typically distribute one-year-old bare root seedlings. Um, a lot of our chapters distribute one or two-year-old potted seedlings. So typically these aren't going to be really old trees, but um, helpful information. Who was the distribution from? You know, if, if was it through one of your chapters? Was it through TACF? Was it through a person that you remember, or did you just, you know, get it at a plant sale or some random outreach event, <laughs> you know, but the more information you have, the better. And then if you have the details on when you actually planted those trees um, in your space, then that'll be helpful for you to get those plantings entered. So I think that's where I was planning to stop with this portion of the show. Thanks, Kendra. And, and I'll add, I mean, I know that there's a lot of, um, a lot of uh, folks that have gotten seeds. So, so from TACF, we're, we're gathering those records right now. And like Kendra said, once we get a bulk distribution um, method, which we should have within the next couple of weeks, we'll be able to get those distribution. So if you re have received um, the uh, B3F3s through the sponsorship program or through the wild tree program, we'll be able to get you guys those um, accounts relatively soon. And I'm hoping we can be like, boom, got you an account, you'll get an email, you'll be able to go in. Um, for some other people, I know many of you have gotten seeds, for example, from Alan Nichols. So um, if we can work with Alan and he, and if you encourage him to put together a similar spreadsheet of what he sent you, the year it was sent, who you are and your email address, then we can upload that in, boom, you get an email, you've got an account in the system. Because what we've been had, I mean, we've had dozens, if not hundreds of requests for accounts in the system, and we just can't do it. Um, everybody gets an account manually. We really, because of the interest we've had, we're gonna have to do this more programmatically. And so the more that we can have, we already have, it's a list of people who have received material, the year that they received it, who they received it from, who they are and their information, the faster we're gonna be able to get you an account. So I think if you've received material from TACF, you'll get that first. If you've received material from someone who has sent out a lot of material, like the main chapter or like Alan Nichols or like Pennsylvania, New Jersey, we can get you guys an account a lot more quickly and you should be able to get something automated if we have your email address. Um, 
So uh, I think Kendra, I saw a question in the Q and A of is there a standard format for gathering the records? I think we'll be working on getting that out to people. Is that correct? I think we should. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I so think it'll be basically that slide I just shared of like, what do you know? Just as much as you as you do know would be really helpful. Yeah, or a form or or, or something else. Um, just and and stuff like who you are too, so we can get you in the system. Um, I've had a couple questions about Dunstans. Are you interested in Dunstan plantings? Um, so so you guys know, and there's nothing wrong with Dunstans, but they're pretty much a Chinese chestnut. Um, I know people want to track their own Dunstans, and that's fine. We can do that in the system. Um, it'll be a lower priority simply because it's not necessarily what we're trying to do from our diversification or restoration program. So we can track Dunstan plantings. Um, if you've had something distributed to you or you want immediate access to be able to track that, more than likely that'll be lower on the realm of, of priority for us to get that information in the system. Um, so ultimately we would like to have that in there because I think it's interesting to track them, but it's not a high priority for us. Do you have anything to add on there, Kendra? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, you know, I for things like a Dunstan, we're not going to have the specific cross records, but we could make Dunstan 2018, Dunstan 2019, Dunstan 20, you know, we could make a list of those crosses. Um that don't really link to a whole lot in terms of a wild tree, but it would enable you to get those in there. Um, and that's what we're going to need to do in, in some of the cases, you know, like the chapters, for example, my main chapter has been distributing wild type Americans that are from Maine. We know they're from Maine. We know they're from a handful of wild trees that they harvest from most years, but they haven't kept track of exactly which cross they've sent to which person. And that's fine. You know, we didn't ask them to do that. Um, hopefully we can be better about that moving forward, but you know, I'm not, we can't retroactively create those records. So we may have a cross in our system called Maine wild type American 2018. And if you got wild type seeds from Maine in 2018, that's the cross you get. And that's un unfortunately as much of that's as drilled down as we can get into the original source, but at least we know what state it's from. So, um, yeah, there'll be some of that certainly needing to happen. Yeah, there's a question about, um, so Jim says, you know, I, I've gotten nuts from ACF or ESF, but the tags have faded over time. What, what does he do in that situation? So I would, okay. sorry. Um, yeah, so the, the, they're from ATAC or ACCF. Um, oh, it says, I think no. it says ACH, but I think he meant TACF. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, we we should have records of things that we have sent out through our programs, so it's very possible it'll be handled by just getting our bulk distributions entered. Um, but if not, you know, if you know what year you got it, you know, I know I've done a lot of planting of B3, F3s as demonstration plantings where the specific cross wasn't tracked. We just know it was a B3, F3 from Meadowview from a given year. Um, and so again, we can use those kind of dummy crosses to collect the best information we have without having the really you know specific and unfortunately you just won't know exactly what you have for a tree we're not gonna be able to track that back you know backtrack that um but we can still get them into the system that way john says i have the cold stream i think wild type do you want to track those and i don't know what cold stream is but so if you have more information about that like i know some nurseries a lot of people have had stuff from nurseries like um, I'm blanking on on the name of the folks that like Oikos or you know, even if you got something from Route 9, like, you know, it's great that you know the nursery it's from, but if you know like the specific background that it came from, because some nurseries sell Chinese, some nurseries sell hybrids, like Route 9 Empire, you know, Greg has a wildlife hybrid and he has different cultivars of Chinese chestnuts. The more information you can get us, the better. Um, and and we are like I, like Kendra said, the more that we the more information we have, we'll prioritize those trees with the most information to get them in there, and the things that we can do in bulk. Um, so Coldstream, if you have more information about that, what it, is it from Long Island or something? Like where where is that from, and and how can we get that? When when did you plant it? Who did you get it from? You know that kind of stuff is going to be really important. 
Um, Eva says, when or if D58 crosses are distributed and planted, how do you track their spread? I, you know, that's a really good question and something that, Kendra, do you think that you and I will be, <laughs> I don't know that we'll be doing that. Um, I think the white, the white hairs that are hiding under my bangs um, will be much more numerous by the time uh, we have that to deal with. But I'm yeah. sure, you know, if we, if we can continue to maintain dentata base and continue to adapt it to the needs that we have at, at any given time, I'm sure we will have a solution for that if that's something we need to be tracking. Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately we are going to be interested in that. You know, what we're primarily going to be interested in is where things are planted. And I think we'll, at that time, we'll be able to see where we're at from a restoration standpoint. And so that spread will absolutely be important, you know, because that's a part of restoration. And 20 years from now, we'll have we'll have a solution. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, how can my institution contact you about getting on board with Dentata Base? We have several saplings planted around our campus. Um, let us get things in Dentata Base. And if we have the person who to whom those trees were distributed, they should get a notice. Um, and so we'll send stuff out once we get all that stuff in and maybe we can start that process then, Tyler. Um, all right, so I've, I've taken a lot of time to answer some of those questions. I am on the hook for talking about wild trees. Let me do that really quick. Um, because I know some of you have material from wild trees. Um, so what's in there currently, you get to see my email. Um, what's in Dentata Base currently and what can you see and what you can't see? Um, so the big thing to know, going back to wild trees and trying to protect PII or personally identifiable information or people's private property, we don't announce the location of most trees in here. Um, so I'm going to click on just a, a tree from Alabama here. Um, it has a lot of information. Um, depending on your access level in here, you may or may not see this tree. Um, so this is on um, the Ruffin Mountain Nature Preserve. It says it's not publicly viewable. So that means you would not have access to seeing this tree unless you are directly connected to it. You're not going to see all this additional information. So if you wanted to be able to use this as a tool to find trees near you, it's not necessarily going to, and, and um, tree snap works in very similar of a, of a way. You don't necessarily get the exact locations of trees simply to protect private property. So um, if you're looking to try and see what all is in here, you will be able to get a general sense of where things are. We, we, we fuzz data. So you, if, if you zoom out and you look at the Alabama chapter and click on their wild trees, you would get a map that looks like this, but it would not be giving the exact location. It would be giving something within about a five mile radius. The same thing happens with these parcels where planted trees are. Depending on your level of access, you are going to get a fuzzed location. If you have direct, if you have been given explicit access to view that, you will see the exact location, but most of you won't have that unless it's your specific tree. So um, a lot of people contact us and say, well, do you have this tree in your database? Should I go out and get it? You know, because even if we do have the tree in our database, that'll be another um, observation on that tree and we can match them up with lat longs. So um, I wouldn't necessarily, I, I don't encourage you guys to contact us to ask whether or not we have a tree in the system. Just go ahead and grab it, get us that information because we'll add it to our, the observations that we already have in the system. Um, how do you look up a tree in the system? Again, it, it depends on whether or not you have access to it. Um, so if you are given, if you found that tree, or if we have given you explicit access as a wild tree locator or as a wild tree location manager in the system, you'll be able to look those up. Um, otherwise, you won't have access to, to look up specific trees. Uh, same thing happens in TreeSnap. So um, about the, the interaction between TreeSnap and, and, and Dentata Base, if you send us in a, um, a leaf sample and the TreeSnap location, we will put it in Dentata Base. Otherwise, we don't have tree snap locations in Dentata Base. And the main reason for that is because we want to be able to verify everything in Dentata Base as having been um, evaluated and identified 
microscopically and through our process. So right now in tree snap, um, there, there's lots of other species, but if, if I go down into American chestnut, if I go down here into Louisville, if I click this tree, that actually does look like an American chestnut. Um, this is not an American chestnut. And there's a lot of them in here of trees that looks like a, it's certainly an oak, maybe a chinkapin oak. Um, but the issue with tree snap is that we don't have a really robust community in here um, identifying trees from, from pictures. And so, um, and, and there's no way to really say what something is. We can say it is an American chestnut or it is not, but we can't say if it's not an American chestnut, what it is. So currently those two systems live separately. If you wanna get a tree in database, you can absolutely log its information in TreeSnap, send us a sample, send us the tree snap ID. You don't have to fill out the whole form. Then we'll get it in database once we identify it um, in person. Um, the tree locator form is available here on the website. It's under resources. Click on tree identification. Um, have your trees identified. Read this really closely, how to send in a sample. Please don't send it in a plastic bag. Please don't send it in to us wet. All we end up with is a moldy mess. Um, and it's nasty. Um, we have some really great pictures. Maybe we should do a, a chestnut chat about that one day, all the fun things that we've if received the, through the mail. If the scent isn't part of it, I don't think you get the full experience. It has right. a really distinct smell. We need a, we need a, 4D, a 4D presentation to really showcase that one. Um, but, but once you uh, read how to take a sample and get it to us, here's the tree locator form. If you don't want to use tree snap, um, that's fine. Fill out this form the old fashioned way. It is fillable as an, a fillable Adobe PDF. You can type everything in. Um, like I said, if you did use tree snap, all you got to do is write this number on the form and send it to us because the other stuff is, is collected in tree snap. Um, and with all the exception, the I will say, with the exception of your name and contact and the landowner's name and contact, uh, and that, right. because TreeSnap does not tell us who owns the property. Um, so if you reported it, we can assume maybe it's on your property, but we don't actually know that. And often that's actually not the case. So, so let me amend that then. Thanks, Kendra. So if you send us the, the tree locator form, fill out the TreeSnap ID, the owner of the property, and, and your name and your address and information. That'll, that'll be a good way to do it. If you don't put it in tree snap, fill out the whole form and send it to us. Um, and then we'll, um, if you have sent in a tree locator form, we get your information into Dentatabase eventually. Um, usually there's about a year lag before, at least for my lab, um, before it gets in, but, but it is in there eventually. Um, all right, anything I missed about wild trees, Kendra? I don't think so. If folks want to see what it looks like with low access, I can just share my screen real quick and yeah, just show for that. Um, so if you're, yeah, if you're in the citizen scientist role and you can't see everything, you still can see a fair amount in this list. So I have this filtered on mastered island trees. You still see that there's 715 trees that have been reported in Massachusetts. Um, I think half of those are from Mark Meal throw that <laughs> accolade out there. Um, but you can at least look and see if you know what town, you know, uh, every chapter names and codes their wild trees differently. In New England, I have it pretty standardized to use town names and then the road or some other descriptor afterwards. Um, so sometimes you can figure it out. Like if you know, well, I found a tree in Andover. Well, there's a 13 trees in Andover and maybe one of these is a tree that you found or maybe none of them do. And so that could give you an indication of whether or not you should go and check it out um, or send us a sample. If you click on the record, as Sarah said, it's not going to um, show you absolutely everything, um, but it's going to show you some of the information. And this one looks like is actually on public property. So it's actually showing you the real location. Someone asked if um, in the chat, if um, fudge locations were um, uh, made apparent to folks and they should be. Um, it is on oh, yeah. the map. They just, 
Yeah, on the map. So here, this just doesn't show up on the map. I probably just don't have a GPS coordinate coordinate for this. But if you go to like the chapters map, let's just look at Connecticut because I know there'll be something in there. If the parcel, so right down here, this um, the green are markers reflect an accurate location, and if they're gray, they are they do not reflect an accurate location. They're they're close, but they're not right on where those parcels or wild trees are. So you can see almost all the wild trees in Massachusetts are on private property. So those aren't going to show up um, as green, but there are a few like this one here that you could drill down into and see more information about. So that's a lot of this trees. One, it is a lot of trees. There's a lot of trees in Massachusetts. Well, no, this is, this, this is Connecticut. That's Connecticut. There's Connecticut. Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of chestnut in Connecticut. Um, but anyway, so that's kind of you know, how you can, it, it, as much as you can interact with that wild tree system. And, and as Sarah said, you know, when, when in doubt, feel free to send us a sample. Worst thing is we, we start entering it and realize we already have it. But um, in most cases, most of them are new. Um, so, Thanks, and then Kendra. I think someone else had asked about um, if we had announced how to get an account. Um, we did not because we are not ready. <laughs> so, um, again, that list of information that we shared earlier, you know, what is the cross? When did you get it? Who did you get it from? Um, was it a seed or a seedling when you received it? Um, and where did you plant it? You know, as much of that information as you can get on what you received and then also just where you put it, um, that's going to help you be ready to plant those. The information on what you got helps us create those distributions. So if we haven't been able to handle those with a big bulk distribution of material through kind of our standard programs, we can start getting those in after that. Um, and we can work with you to get that. But the more information you have, the better and the easier it is on our end to not have to create too many new things. Um, so stay tuned. We'll let you know <laughs> when and we're ready um, to start getting folks in for this kind of data entry. And a couple of things. So someone says, if, uh, I have four B3, F3 crosses. Uh, should I just sit tight? Yes. So for stuff distributed from TACF, we have a good record of what we sent and to whom we sent them. So we'll be able to bulk upload those and get you an ID more quickly. So most likely that'll be our first contingency of people to try this out. Um, uh, I think... A lot of you are, we said in a previous chestnut chat um, that you won't be able to get D58 pollen until your tree is in there. That is correct, but we're not gonna send pollen out to backyard tree owners this season anyway. So there's really no rush to make sure you get stuff for the season. Um, even if we get the, D, the call for deregulation and time for pollinations, um, we're gonna focus on so uh, primarily our GCOs and primarily the locations where we know the background and we know we can hit a huge amount of diverse backgrounds this season. So our goal is to make sure that all y'all get, that's a West Virginia term, that all y'all get in to the system by next summer um, or even the summer. Um, we might be able to do distribu distributions next summer. We're not sure yet. We have to see how the regulatory process goes. But um, there's no real rush to get everybody in by this season. Um, so uh, sit tight, do as much information gathering as you can on your end. Um, give us a little bit of time to get you in there. The more information you have, the better. Um, we'll develop some tools for you guys to know and some guidelines on how to get that information together um, and, and get you some more information as time goes on. Uh, Bill says, will there be more specific source information of the tree the nut came from that prioritizes D58 pollen distribution? Um, kind of, I mean, really, it, there's a lot of material. If, if there's a lot of material that came from one place, it's going to be less likely that we're going to want to go after it than another. So, um, for example, a lot of stuff from the South is of high priority because we don't have a lot of that material. Um, as Kendra showed you, there's a ton of material all over Connecticut and Massachusetts. Um, we'll have to know really specific information about where something came from to know whether or not it's going to hit a, um, a, an area of interest of ours. So, you know, if you just say, I know it came from Massachusetts, 
that's going to be less of, uh, of interest than if we know it came from this specific location and it's of, it's of a place where we have very little, um, very little other representation. So I don't think that it'll be really a list of things that we'll be able to provide to you. It'll be more of, of you all knowing the specific location and whether or not it matches um, to what we already have or not. Um, Russ asked if there's um, a, a Git repo on GitHub where you can do open access. Um, we'll talk with our developers uh, about this on our next meeting next week. And Russ and anyone else who wants to get involved, join us Tuesdays at noon <laughs> for, um, yeah, shoot us an email if you want to get involved in the development. Um, we can certainly use um, more help. Uh, we, like I said, we've had volunteers um, involved uh, over the past, you know, 15 years of, of development, and we could certainly use it as far as whether to open it up for the greater development community. Um, we'll start that conversation because we haven't had anyone interested yet. So you'd, you'd be one of the first and we'll, we'll see what we can get you. Um, but, but shoot us an email so we can have that. We can continue that conversation. I see Kendra feverishly typing. We're a couple minutes here toward the end. I think we, we hit everything. Oh, you, did you hit the Miyazaki? And I don't know if I'm saying that right. Did you hit that question? I just said it sounded cool. So give it a try. I mean, yeah. our orchard plantings are for specific orchard projects. So if we're asking, you know, if you're doing an orchard for us, you're pretty well, you should be aware that that's what you're doing. Um, as far as plantings on your own personal property with, um, with trees you get from us, however you want to play with those, we're interested to hear how it goes. Um, you know, some people want to put those right in the front yard as demonstration trees. Some people like to plant them in the woods um, or intermix them with other things. Um, you know, put cages around them and see how the goats do, whether or not they'll eat them or not. <laughs> so really, whatever you want to do is fine. We don't have a, a strong preference. We just would love to hear what's working or what fails miserably so that we can let other folks know um, what to try and maybe what to avoid. All right. Well, thanks, Kendra. Um, thank you all for showing up and your interest in database and tracking your trees. It will be important. Um, we will be ready for you guys um, uh, as soon as possible. Um, sit tight. We're about to enter into a very busy field season. Um, my expectations of having stuff together before field season, um, maybe, but more likely we'll we'll put, do a big push for for more stuff this fall and winter. Uh, that's usually our our data working um, process, but hopefully we can get something. If you've had material distributed from TACF, um, that will probably be our, our first round of, of folks who will get IDs and we'll test out that system first. And then we'll do, we'll slowly roll out other uh, access to other stuff. Any other final thoughts, Kendra? No, I'm, I'm just psyched sure. so many people showed up to yeah. learn how to use the database because yeah. we use it all the time, but it's not always the uh, easiest sell to get folks yes. um, using it. So thanks for being here. All right. Join us next month for uh, more information and news about the documentary and how it was made and how we got how we got Dolly Parton to be a part of it. I think it's a really fun story. So, yeah. Um, all right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next month.